and oh, yesterday. Anyway, okay, so um, let's go on from this morning. So, so I discussed the um, two po the the two point function of uh, the adiabatic mode. So we got a formula that looked like uh, the two point function of this adiabatic mode was uh, h square over m Planck square epsilon and in the case where I had this uh, additional uh, additional quadratic term and and the and the um, fluctuations propagated so I'm uh, uh, propagated le different than the speed of light there will also be a CS here I'm uh, um, so let me just do like that so I'm not putting the delta function of momentum conservation I'm not putting some two pi so the same, uh, the same, uh, um, that, that action had uh, three degrees of freedom, so there was the scalar mode and there were the two polarizations of uh, the gravitational waves. If you repeat that exercise for the gravitational waves, you discover the, this formula. So, um, so in in cases where cs is so the ratio between between gravitational waves and the scalar mode this tensor to scalar ratio is basically proportional to epsilon and cs okay so um the smaller the epsilon the smaller the gravitational waves the smaller the the, the relative to so this we already know we we know that this combination is uh, 10 to the minus 5 squared so zeta is the temperature fluctuations in the CMB are 10 to the minus 5. So this combination of parameters, we already know. Okay, so it's like 10 to minus 10 is the square of zeta. So this one, we don't know, but the ratio is just basically proportional to both epsilon and CS. So the smaller the epsilon, rel relatively speaking, the less gravitational waves, and the same is true with the CS. Okay, so where are we to see... Um, gravitational waves in the near future, for example, this will al already constrain CS not to be very small. Okay. Um, but we will talk about constraints on CS in a little while, uh, different type of constraints on CS in a little while. Um, what else uh, did I want to point out? I already said um, about the uh, scale invariance. Um, so, um, okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about uh, about uh, the, Gauss, the, the, the statistical properties, whether the fluctuations are Gaussian or, or not. So uh, what I have computed so far with the quadratic Lagrangian is just the two-point function, right? So um, if, uh, if we have just a, f a free field, in the case I just uh, ignore all the interactions, each mode of uh, the, both the scalar fluctuations and, uh, and um, and uh, the tensor modes, uh, each of them, you have just a f free field, a collection of harmonic oscillator, oscillators. So if you are in the vacuum state, which I've also assumed the wave function of the harmonic oscillator in the vacuum is a Gaussian. And so um, zeta is a Gaussian distribution, and this is the variance of that Gaussian distribution. In other words, practically in the case of the... In the case of the CMB, you could imagine doing the following thing. You could imagine taking the map of the CMB and just uh, plotting that, that has a you measure a given temperature in each point on the sky, and you just do the histogram of how many pixels have this temperature, how many pixels have that other temperature. What you discover, observational fact, uh, very nice Gaussian distribution, and the uh, width of this Gaussian is just the given by, it was related to, to this. So we infer this from the width of the Gaussian or from the power spectrum. The power spectrum of the, that, that other curve, the CL curve, in this language is just, uh, if you wanted to compute here the, the variance of this Gaussian, let me call it sigma square. So in this particular case, you could imagine taking pixels or regions on the sky of different sizes, right? Big ones or small ones. So, and for each of them, we find a Gaussian distribution with a different variance. The variance that depends on how big the pixel is, that variance is just the, it related to this. It's just uh, basically the integral of this curve gives you the variance up to a maximum L related to the size of the pixel. Fluctuations much smaller than the size of the pixel do not contribute to this variance. So this is another, this is another interpretation for this curve. Okay? But uh, regardless of, uh, so 
so that's just uh, this curve is just about the width of this of this Gaussian distribution. You can still ask the question whether or not, or to what extent this distribution is not a Gaussian. Maybe it has some tail or something. Okay, we so far have not uh, have not detected any um, departure from uh, a perfect Gaussian distribution. Now. Um, so a Gaussian distribution is just characterized by the variance, okay, by this parameter. In reality, we are me measuring maps on the sky. So, um, for example, I in the case of this histogram, you could measure the, what we, you would call, I don't know, the skewness of the distribution, whether it has some cubic component or whether it has some delta t to the fourth that is not the part that just comes from the variance square, okay? So these are, would all be departures from Gaussianity in uh, because we have a field on the sky we don't need to take this would be taking all the points to be the same one right so the average of delta of the temperature cubed over all the points of the sky we can take the average of point here by point there and point there always separated by a given configuration so I could do a three-point function in which I have you know this triangle like that and I look at all the places in the sky where I have this combination and take the average, see if I see something non-zero. So we, uh, of course, have done that. And then it, the, that three-point function now depends on what configuration of points, what's the shape of this triangle that, uh, that uh, you are checking. So you can check all the shapes that you invent, you look around, and uh, basically the situation, although I, I might quote numbers uh, in a little while, is that we've searched for, for these departures from Gaussianity and we have not found them. Okay? So in the context of inflation, this uh, would mean that uh, this assumption that, that uh, we're just looking at, uh, at uh, the vacuum wave function of some simple harmonic oscillators or just the, two po the, the quadratic Lagrangian of the, of the whole thing is good enough. Okay, so let's discuss. We already we had the action there for the um, for the adiabatic mode. So that action, I just uh, told you the the result of the quadratic part of the action. But you could go on and see how big those things are. Is it is it reasonable that we have not yet seen anything? On, on, under what circumstances the interaction? So now, if if it's not just a collection of harmonic oscillators, but there is some interactions, then the the the, the wave function will not be perfectly Gaussian. You'll get something different there. Okay. So what what do we expect? Um, um, and the fact that uh, is the fact that we haven't seen anything uh, surprising or not, and to what extent we would want to push these measurements a little bit further to perhaps have a hope to see something and what this something might mean. That's what I want to discuss today, okay? Or now. Um, great, so um, good. So, so, so the first thing that you need to do then, this one is, goes up, although probably if I, okay. so, um, so, okay, so one thing that uh, we, so the, the procedure this morning was the following. I took this uh, most general action. I uh, used these ADM variables, N and NI, solve for the constraint equation, plug it back in. I only told you the, the, <coughs> the terms up to quadratic order. Um, so same procedure, okay? To th let's, if you want to talk about three-point functions, I need to go all the way to the cubic Lagrangian. So just take a look at what the cubic Lagrangian is. It's all fixed in terms of uh, those parameters that we already had. The, uh, this H, H dot over the epsilon, the CS, you know, given those parameters, I just need to crank up, you know, crank the thing one more order. Okay, so it's, it's all fixed. Um, so I'm going to, okay, I will not do that because it's tedious, but you can find it in many papers. So let me just tell you, um, let me just tell you one of the terms of the cubic Lagrangian. Uh, looks like this. So it would be A cubed, epsilon, CS squared. So it would be some cubic term which looks something like this. Um, anyway, some, something. Okay, it doesn't. And uh, you, you can see, for example, that you get terms 
so this a term zeta dot times zeta, zeta dot squared times zeta. So remember that the the quadratic Lagrangian looked like zeta dot square minus d i or d d square zeta. Okay, in front of this whole thing, there was really some square root of g. So for example, among other things, so the square root of g, uh, just would is would have a cubed e to the three zeta. Remember that uh, in the way I wrote the uh, I wrote the the metric zeta and a came together. So definitely there will be terms of the form zeta times zeta dot like this one, zeta times zeta dot square, just from there. So and there's plenty of things. Okay, so I don't. That, that's the reason why I'm not doing it because it's very tedious. Okay, um, but. Um, it's very tedious, but but straightforward. Okay, so um, so now if I want to, um, but what I do want to do is estimate. Um, sorry, I, I put two c s squares. Too much, so I already have it there. So um, so um, I I want to I want to estimate. Um, no, sorry, it was co it was correct. Um, I want to estimate the size of so how how much d what do I expect for for that? So okay, I can try to do so. The st the correct calculation what you have to do um, you do perturbation theory with this interaction. You compute the three point function. Okay, tedious thing. For for today, I will just uh, try to do orders of magnitude. So one one uh, so so if I if I want to see how non Gaussian something. Will be one simple estimate would be to take this uh, part of the Lagrangian, the cubic Lagrangian, divided by the quadratic Lagrangian, see how big that is. So how how big is the is this uh, correction to the quadratic Lagrangian? Okay. So if you do so, I will estimate this by taking the cubic part divided by the quadratic Lagrangian. Okay. What do you get? So you basically get the following formula: one over c s square. Um, so from from this term. I'm keeping uh okay good I, one thing that I want to say um is that uh, I'm focusing on the on the interactions that come from the CS term okay there are other interactions that so that's why I said uh, let me focus on one of the I I will discuss all of them uh in a little while but I'm focusing on the ones that that have the CS because I because I think that's part of uh, an interesting story um so it looks like this. So let's let's epsilon is a very small number. Let's consider. So the first thing you notice w when you see here, obviously, if I'm asking the question how uh, non uh, the non Gaussian, I'm estimating this way. This is a cubic. This is quadratic. So this is cubic in the zeta in the perturbation. This is quadratic in the perturbation. So whatever I do, there will be a zeta here. Okay. So and this is ten to the minus five. So this is the first uh, thing. Okay. So the reason why. Um, the reason why uh, we, naive, we naively expect things to be pretty Gaussian is that we see the perturbations to be very small. So unless there is some very large coupling coefficient of some kind, given that the zeta is 10 to minus 5, unless there's some compensating 10 to the 5 somewhere, I will get a small number. Okay? So that's not so surprising. And, and in terms of observations, if you want um, this, this estimate, you, you might want to compare with the dimensionless uh, so this is the variance so this is the dimensionless level of non gaussianity in the data like the the, the skewness divided by the variance to the 3 half so it it's dimensionless so that is apart from some numerical factors what we are estimating with this okay so if i have to ask the question do i expect a big skewness Unless there's a big number somewhere, I, I expect this thing to be 10 to minus 5. And then perhaps a big number or not. Let's see. Okay? So the reason I focused on this, on this uh, particular uh, term is because this is the one term that um, um, has this big potential enhancement, which is this 1 over cs squared that if you're propagating it's much smaller than the speed of uh, light. Then this is can be a big number, okay? Not ten to the five because if not the whole thing will just uh, break down the whole perturbative, but uh, 
you can you can say I'm propagating at a tenth of the speed of light, and so this is a factor of a hundred. Okay, so so that's um, so this epsilon is a, so let's in that limit epsilon is a small thing. Cs is much smaller than than one say, so this is just a number three over Cs squared. Okay, so the the one in possible enhanced uh, term is is uh, that one. So um, so okay, so let let me let me. Um, so if, if you look at the, at, so the summary of when you do that calculation for estimating the level of non gaussianity is the following. If we are taking models where, if we are having s speed of propagation much smaller than the, than the speed of light, then we get 1 over Cs squared times zeta for the level of non gaussianity. This is for the limit Cs much smaller than 1. Okay? In the limit, um, Let's say the, the, the canonical example. So if you just uh, take uh, the, the sim remember that uh, um, this this uh, so so the simple all the simple examples d phi square minus v of phi these kind of simple examples they have CS of one. Okay, so if you do that calculation, you discover just epsilon times zeta. Okay, so um, so the um, Epsilon and, and eta, but let me just, eta is the other slow row parameter. So, um, so in the case of, uh, so the non Gaussianities are small for two reasons. First reason, okay, given that the perturbations are small, if the couplings are small, then uh, uh, this is going to be a small number. But also, in the standard case, it's even further suppressed because this epsilon is a small number. So it's even smaller than just, uh, so if you think of this as, okay, What's happening is that uh, you're in, so you have some sort of vertex here. You have two fluctuations. They interact. They produce something. This is what we are talking about. Okay. So this vertex in the in the standard and they interact for only a small amount of time because w when the modes are well inside the horizon, you're in the vacuum, and when the modes exit the horizon, they're already outside the horizon. So all of the interaction happened over the one Hubble time of horizon exit. Okay, so there's some interaction over one Hubble time, and the, the, the parameter is, in the standard case, is just epsilon. Okay, so um, in the simple example, non-Gaussianities are really tiny. Okay, um, and uh, I, I will spend later a little bit more time talking about the epsilon there, uh, because it's also a little bit, uh, maybe not surprising, but it's it's interesting. Um, yeah. um, how I can um, orchestrate a model with this in terms of scalar fields? Let me discuss an example in a little while. Yeah, but uh, if you're just thinking uh, of um, yeah, if, if, yeah, so this is, an, a, if you just are agnostic about exactly how you're making it, okay, another, one property of this material is the speed at which the adiabatic mode is propagating, and, and, uh, and so it's a free parameter. And, um, and uh, I think it's interesting the fact that, uh, so I think it, it's interesting the fact that uh, if you want the perturbations to um, travel much different than the speed of light, then you are forced to have the perturbations which are quite non-Gaussian, at least much, much more non-Gaussian than in the standard case. There's no freedom of this, because this is an interaction that's fixed on you uh, from, uh, so it, once you put this quadratic term to change the CS, it's not just quadratic, and uh, it has some interactions that are completely fixed. And I will discuss a little bit in an example. I mean, um, we now understand this pretty well, but just uh, um, I think that's a, a, an interesting point. And in fact, that's how we know that the speed of propagation of these waves is not very large. I forget now the exact limit, but higher than the, not very small, higher than the, than say a tenth or something like that than the speed of light. We don't know this because we haven't seen that, uh, that, uh, uh, but, but that, that uh, um, um, any departures from Gaussianity, okay? So now let let me let me um, let me um, before 
going into more details of, of the shapes of these non-Gaussianism and so on. Let me quickly talk about, we haven't seen anything, what level do we have, are we, have we looked for? Okay, what, what kind of level do you think or that, that we have checked? So the question is how well we can measure something like this, okay? To see if, I told you it's going to be very small because zeta is a small number, but how well are we measuring this? Okay, maybe we are measuring this way, this well. The answer is we are not measuring it this well. And it's very easy. So let's just stick with the example in which we are measuring just the, the, uh, the, the third moment of a distribution like that. Okay, so as you know, um, if you are measuring any moment of a distribution like that, the um, error bar that, the, that uh, you get scales basically as the square root of the number of uh, pixels, okay? Or the number of samples that you had there. So you have to compare this 10 to the minus 5 with the square root of, so the, the, this dimensionless, um, dimensionless uh, endpoint functions, if you write them like this, you have n samples of a Gaussian distribution, you're looking, so let's say you take a Gaussian distribution and it has a little bit of a departure, how well you can, how, how small of a endpoint function you can find. For this value, it's just 1 over the square root of the number of pixels. It's not 1, it's 3 for the 3 point, or 6 for the 3, 6 over n square root or something, but roughly speaking, you can measure for the 3 point function, but let's just say 1 over the number of pixels to the 1 half, okay? The number of samples that you've measured. In the CMB, I'm talking about the pixels in the map. That's what we're talking about. So, um, so how many how many ma how many pixels have we measured on independent samples do we have in the CMB maps? It's basically around a million. Okay, so we can measure this to a part in a ten to the three at the current time because there's just not enough samples that we've able to recover. And so we will only we 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 have no sensitivity to something like this because this is. 10 to the minus 5, and this is 10 to the minus 2, okay? So we are way, way off. We, we're not going to see that. So we, this we don't, ex even couplings of order 1, we are not uh, expected to have seen already. And in order to make progress, it only goes as the square root of the number of pixels. So you need to make things, if you want to have this 10 times better, you need a map 100 times more pixels, okay? 10 times the result. So it's a, and equivalently, um, it, the only, if we are talking about constraining this, it better be that 1 over cs squared is more or less a factor of 100, so that 100 times 10 to the minus 5 is the 10 to the minus 3. Okay, that's why I said, roughly speaking, we know that this is bigger than 0.1 of the speed of light. If it was uh, smaller than that, we would have seen something and we haven't seen it. Okay? But I think it's very nice that there is this connection uh, between non-Gaussianity and, and the speed of propagation. It's uh, the fact that the perturbations are so small, well, then, then the whole game of looking for non-Gaussianity is very difficult because if this whole thing is a perturbative thing, it's going to be very small. So we are in, in, in a, we have a, lo a, long, a long way to go and the improvements go to like the square root of the, of, the, of the number of samples. And that's the reason why um, People think that what we want to do is make measurements. The CMB is a two-dimensional map, so the, if, we, if we could measure something in three dimensions, it's e the, 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 the number of pixels here goes like the area, and the other one like the volume, so if we can make big maps of big volumes with big, good resolution, we could improve this by a big factor. But we need to improve. If we ever wanted to get to something like that, it's a long, it's a long way. Okay, so. It's, uh, we have a lot, of a lot of things to do. So, um, um, any questions about this so far? Yeah? Um, no, I did not assume anything. Um, if, uh, so this, it follows from, it's, it just follows directly from the Lagrangian that I wrote uh, in the pre which was the most general thing. Of course, it was, it was an expansion in both derivatives and in perturbations. So were these to become uh, a big number, then why should I stop in the cubic and quite everybody would be big and so the whole thing would make no sense, right? So, or I, I have to be more careful about it. But uh, so I am, a, uh, so, but n 
the, because this is 10 to the minus 5, and all the things that were entering there were this CS, and nothing is get. I mean, okay, CS is in the denominator. So had, had it been, say, uh, uh, 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light, that's, that, that would be, you know, that, that would make this very big. So we have to be more careful. Um, but the main reason, I mean, we see very small fluctuations, so it's reasonable to expect the whole thing is per perturbative. Fine. Any other questions? Okay, so why is there this connection between uh, between the CS and uh, and um, why is there some connection between the CS, the speed of propagation of the waves, and the um, and uh, and the level of non-Gaussianity. Well, I mean, this if if this is something that I cannot, uh, if, if this is something that I have no freedom, and it's like if I change C S, it will be there. There it might be, there must be some simple reason, right? And the simple reason might be some symmetry, something in Lorentz invariance, the symmetry. Okay, so um, so let let me just take the example in which. Just uh, to be doing very easy, uh, take the example in which um, in which uh, the CS is very small. Okay, so then then what I would have is some fluid that's a non-relativistic fluid where things move very slowly. Okay, so then the equations for the fluid. What are the equations for a fluid? Let's take uh, um, the equation for momentum conservation. Okay, for example, if it has some pressure, something like this. So rho plus p, this kind of equation for a fluid. So what is forced on me in this case now is Galilean invariance. Is the fact that I have to write here the convective derivative, right? So if the ddt is v dot graph. So this quadratic term, this interaction is forced on me by the Galilean invariance. Okay? Is this term that is giving when I when I so and the level of non-Gaussianity I can estimate in this case by looking at how big is this with respect to that. Okay, so it would be v dot grad v over dv dt. Okay, so if I linearize the equation, I would get this equals to that and do linear perturbations. This is the interaction. This is the thing that's forced on me by Galilean symmetry, and it's from such a thing in that 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 is coming. So. Um, so you can see here that, uh, let's go to Fourier space, you get a K, you get V left over, and omega, okay? So, ome so, so this is giving you, uh, so remem remember that omega is K times C, S, now, if it's, uh, so already this is giving you V over C, S. So the level of non-Gaussian, already you are seeing the 1 over C, S, it's really 1 over C, S squared, and, uh, the reason for that is that I've written this in terms of v, but now if I want to, um, there is 1 over cs squared times zeta. So I need to tell you, if you have a fluid, what's the relation between zeta and the v, okay? But uh, th that, that has another, another. So v is related to the gradient of zeta with a cs in the denominator. I, let me not, uh, but it's, it doesn't, so from, from this is the same as zeta over cs squared. Uh, but the, the only point I wanted to make is that is this term is this this in the is Lorentz invariance that is fixing that. Okay, that's why you don't have any any freedom. Okay, so uh, this is this is the way that uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, have information about the speed of propagation of uh, of the of the modes. Notice that. Yeah, the, the quadratic Lagrangian also depends on CS. So you could say, oh, if I knew the Hubble parameter and a new epsilon, then I would also know the, the speed of propagation from there. But I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know the other parameters. So um, it is, it is true. However, that if the CS is going down, then uh, the, then the tensor to scalar ratio is 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 also going down. It goes like epsilon times CS. So I would get another constraint if we see gravitational waves, but if we don't see gravitational waves, and it's still a con it would still be a constraint on epsilon times CS. So he while here, this part of the non-Gaussianity is um, is uh, just uh, just uh, given by CS. Okay. Any any questions? Uh, 
Oh yeah. Um, the the difference in the coefficient in the proportional is some I think it's uh, some sort of a, a, maybe it's a sixteen it's a difference in the one says eight pi uh, something so it's, I think it's a fact that's why tensor to scalaration is sixteen epsilon yeah so there's some pi's that I didn't write down and some twos to Q, blah 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 but the actual uh, the two then there's the two polarizations of the gravitational waves when you take the actual ratio is sixteen so uh, so if you want this this term is 16 times bigger. The, the numerical coefficient is 16 times bigger, which is not a small number. So if if uh, it wasn't because of the 16, we also would not be able. I mean, our our ability to see the gravitational waves would be much worse, right? Uh, sorry. No, h is dimensionless. Zeta is dimensionless. So h over m Planck is dimensionless. So that's okay. And epsilon and cs are dimensionless. So it's okay. Unless, unless, uh, yeah, I don't know what what we think about CS. I, I I don't know. If you think CS is one, yeah, we shouldn't see it. Well, CS is bigger than point one um, at the at the current just from there, right? So I mean, it's just an observational fact that CS is bigger than point one. I don't know from first. I mean, if you, if you just want to stick to simple scalar field model, CS is one, right? So you don't you don't get that. But, um, okay, so so now uh, let's let's talk a little bit in more detail. So um, as I was telling you, um, okay, now, so far I've just talked as if uh, I was just measuring the skewness or something of some distribution of points, but in reality I have a full map and I measure. Or let's just forget about the CMB. Let's just say I make a map of the density of the universe or of the zeta everywhere in the universe, and I try to measure whether it's different from a Gaussian. So I would measure the three-point function, the four-point function, and so on. And so let's discuss in, uh, in a little bit more detail the, the three-point function. So, uh, so let's just talk about the three-point function in Fourier space. Okay, let's just make, imagine that I have a big map of the universe in three dimensions. I, I've, from there, I inferred zeta. I have zeta of k1, zeta of k2, vectors, zeta of k3, x average, OK? This is what we call the three-point function. It, there will be a delta function for momentum conservation. And then there will be some function of k1 and k2 and so on, and this, and this uh, and the parameters, the CS and epsilon. I can write it down. I can write it down if you want. In the case of uh, of CS equals to one, it was first calculated by Juan. Um, um, so it looks something like so. For example, it has uh, so one over k one cubed, one over k one cubed, one over k two cubed, one over k three cubed. It looks something like this, and then some polynomial here, k one k2 square, blah, 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 stuff like this. OK, so there's some formula. Um, now, let me, let me, I want to, I want to, so because of uh, momentum conservation, the, this uh, three-point function is non-zero if the three momentum add up to zero, OK? So we have k1, k2, k3, OK? And they add up to zero. So I want to discuss um, this formula, what it gives in various, uh, for various different shapes of this triangle, okay, and what it means, okay. So when we look at the data, we try to constrain the three-point function as a function of the shape, and from there we really can constrain more than, for example, the term that is proportional to one over CS square has a specific dependence on the size of the triangle and the and the angles and so on. So, in principle, we can tell apart multiple contributions to the to the. Um, to the three-point function that have different shapes, OK? So, um, but rather than uh, giving you some formulas and so on, let me just explain uh, the physical meaning inside of uh, various limits. So, um, so there's, there's two limits that I want to um, consider, uh, or three limits that I will consider. Um, one is what we call kind of equilateral type non-Gaussianity, which is when we have the three case 
are roughly of the same size. This triangle is just like a regular triangle. Nothing is special. Nothing is very small. Comp so all the k's of the same size, more or less, factors of two. Okay, this is equilateral. Ne need not be equ perfectly equilateral. Okay, I'm just saying all the k's, all similar. Okay. Then what we call the squeeze limit, which is when you two take two k's that are very large, k1, k2. And then the K3 is much smaller, okay? So we call this the squeeze limit. So there is like a soft momentum. So, so K1, K2, much bigger than another of the momenta, okay? And then there is, uh, w w it's also interesting to think about an example like that, where say K1, K2, and K3 is like a collapsed triangle. Everybody is almost on top of each other. So let me start by discussing this guy, okay? The squeeze limit. Um, so remember that what, uh, so what is this squeeze limit? So first of all, let's talk about the two-point function. The two-point function is two zeta of k1, zeta of k2, Okay, again, the, there's a delta function of momentum conservation. So in this plot would be k1 and k2 adding to zero. Okay, so um, what that is, is really asking the following question. Imagine that you take a big volume of your survey, okay, and you divide it into pieces, okay, and you measure the power spectrum, the two-point function in each of these pieces, okay, in some momentum. And then you ask the question, does this two-point function vary across space? As long as this uh, volume is much bigger than the, k, the, the, the wavelength of this mode, it's a well-defined, I can measure the power on these small scales, okay? And ask the question of whether it is changing. And the three-point function, what it is, imagine that there is, a, let's talk, the K3 is the long mode, so let's say there is some sort of long mode in this survey, okay? And I've divided my volume, and I look at the two-point function here, two-point function there, I ask, does it vary? And when it varies, does it vary correlated with this guy, so the power is bigger here and smaller here? So this is nothing other than the correlation between the, the variations in the power as a function of position with the long wavelength mode. Okay? In other words, it's nothing other than asking, let's say there's the long wavelength mode, which is the K3, and then there's the short modes. Is the typical amplitude of the short modes different here than here? Okay? That's, and I think it's, it's very, if you, if you just write um, um, the power spectrum in these regions, now remember that if, if you are in a given region, well, if you, if you just do this exercise, calculate the two-point functions in regions like that, and Fourier transform the answer of this and multiply by that, you will see that all you're doing is that. But pictorically, I think, I mean, this part is clearly the two-point function, and you're making, it's not adding to zero, so this means that this two-point function is changing, okay? It's not, uh, so it's not the complete average, but it's whether it's changing, and whether it's changing with that momentum, okay? So that's the question of the squeeze limit. Is the long mode is, are the places where the long mode is different making the short modes behave differently? Okay, in the data. That w would be the question in the data. What is, what is the, 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 the point, uh, what, in inflation, what would this mean? So, um, let's remember the plot from the beginning that uh, of the co-moving, of the co-moving, uh, sizes that was, this makes noise, I don't know. So uh, during inflation, the horizon was like this. During the radiation, the material was like that. So you take some mode, you take some other mode, OK? And so um, in this picture, the long wavelength mode, this is the K3, the long mode. This is the short mode, OK, that is produced later, OK? So now we are talking about interactions between modes. And to produce this, it would need to be the case that when this mode is being produced at the time of horizon crossing, the fact that this mode was there and you know changed the, the universe is not perfectly homogeneous because in some places this mode is positive, some is negative. This affects the amount of um, of uh, 
power that you generate here. So in inflation, is the question is whether the interactions between these modes make it such that the amplitude of fluctuations that you produce at a later time are influenced by the, whatever the mode that was produced earlier, long mode. Okay, so that's uh, that's um, great. But now we you see what's uh, going to happen um, in in regular inflation. Um, single field inflation with just for the adiabatic mode, this will not, um, there will be no correlation, there will be no effect of the long mode on the short modes. I will, I will, so this limit, the squeeze limit is going to be zero in single field inflation. And the reason, let me first give you the physical reason, then I'll give you some more formulas, but remember what inflation is, uh, supposed to do? What, what was it invented for? It was invented for that if you start with a universe that is a little bit inhomogeneous, you inflate the whole thing away and we are not able to see it. Okay, that was the whole point. You take a region, you make it expand it out, and even if there was some differences from place to place at the very beginning, it's so big and it, that th this, these are not something that we can observe. Okay? Great, so this is exactly what is happening to these guys. There was some inhomogeneity, yes, it was produced. But then it got inflated away by all of this inflation that happened between here and here. And by the time these guys are going to be produced, this mode was outside the horizon for a long time, it was stretched out, and there's just no effect on the short modes. So th the fact that inflation is this attractor solution in which even if you start with something that is not the perfect solution, after a while, if you are in there and making me measurements on the size of the horizon, you don't notice. Everything is di di being diluted away and you don't notice. That was the whole point. Okay? And inflation accomplishes this. Uh, if, and if it accomplishes this for some inhomogeneity that was produced and was there from the, pr the part before inflation, it definitely also accomplishes this for something that we produce as we go along, right? What's the difference between, for the point of view of this guy, we can think of inflation starting here. This is something that was there from before, and okay, it's diluted away. So when this guy is being formed, is being uh, produced at a later time, in the context of inflation, um, they, they, they should not see anything, okay? Or to be more specific, when you look at the details of the equations, the the effect is diluted away how? As the wavelength of this perturbation K3 over AH squared. So the effect of this guy, as K3 becomes longer than the horizon, so this thing becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, any effect of the K3 is suppressed in this way, okay? So this means that when we do a, 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 a two-point function, a three-point function in this way, and we take the long modes longer and longer, what we expect is that any residual effect of the long mode should go down, decrease in this way, okay? This, something that when we take the limit like that is going to zero, is what we are calling equilateral, okay? In the, the, in the equilateral shape, this is what's happening. So you take, the, you, you take some value for the, 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 the non-Gaussianity has some, uh, some uh, value when the, when the all the cases are more or less the same, but if you take one very small, the whole thing goes to zero. How it goes to zero like that, okay? So the squeeze limit, if it were to be there, different from going down like k square, it would mean that we are not in this attractor solution, that we are not in this adiabatic mode with single field inflation, right? If we are in the adiabatic mode, forget about it, okay? The way you can see this uh, in the algebra, it's also quite simple. Um, so remember, um, let's see, let me go here. Um, well, I, I, let me not copy all the formulas, but uh, let me um, say, do like this. So uh, the space time was. Um, the, the G00, 1 plus N, BT square, and then there was uh, a, a square, E to the 2 zeta, uh, dx uh, delta J, dxi plus Ni, 
dt dxj plus mj dt. Okay. So now, um, now in the now what's happening is there's the first long wavelength mode. It it is excited, so there is some particular value of zeta from the long wavelength mode. And now in that space time, which is not exactly the sitter, but I slightly perturbed the sitter, the short mode is going to be created. Okay? So now the question is, when the long mode is outside the horizon, what is the form of this zeta and i and n okay, to see how, how perturbed this uh, space time is? So um, all you need to do is solve the equations of motion for zeta for the long mode. And, and, and then plug that in into the solutions of the constraint equation. So this was n squared, I guess. And the constraint equation that I give you for n and n i, OK, and what do you find? So first thing, the solution for zeta, the, the wave functions in perfect the zeta, they look something like this. And being outside the horizon here means k eta going to 0, OK? So uh, when, k, when, when the long mode becomes uh, um, large compared to the horizon, zeta goes to a constant. Zeta is going to some constant value, okay? And if zeta dot is going to zero, in fact, zeta dot is going to zero as this k over a h that I just told you square, okay? And then you can also see that if zeta is going to a constant, then if this zeta dot is going to zero, the two solutions of the constraint equation that I showed you would tell you that this n is going to 1, this ni is going to 0. I mean, you just look in the notes before. And this zeta is a constant. Okay, So this space-time is just the same as it was before with just a rescaled a by a constant. Okay, So this is the same as you had before. So, and the, the whole difference is come from the zeta dot. The part of zeta is not yet 0, but it's going down because of the attractor thingy in this way. Okay. So the algebra is very, very straightforward. Okay. So as the as the mode goes outside the horizon, if you forget about these k over h, h um, terms, all that you have is that in your, if before you thought you were you, you did the calculation in for the two point function in the sitter for uh, for the short mode, now rather than having uh, the Sitter space, you, ha you have basically the same, the Sitter space, but with a rescaled value of x, where the zeta 0 is just the constant. Let's so, OK? So nothing. Whatever was the formula before is the same as it was now. Uh, so this means that the amplitude of the, of the power spectrum, of the amplitude of the short modes, is going to be the same as it was before. Okay, so this is the so-called consistency condition. Maldacena's consistency condition. That, uh, that in some sense, the three-point function has to go to zero in the squeeze limit. Okay? And the physical reason is this. So when we check whether, when we go after the, the, the um, um, non-Gaussianities in this limit, then um, we are seeing, and, and if we see zero, what we are seeing is the fact of is the same as this attractor nature of inflation. Now, um, imagine as we were t uh, talking uh, in the morning that I didn't want to go this route of the adiabatic mode, um, and I wanted to have some other field, or I needed to do this because I do it, was doing this bouncing model. Imagine I was in that situation. Then. What we observe in the late universe is our curvature fluctuations, are the adiabatic modes. So imagine that during inflation you have, in, a, in addition to the adiabatic mode, you have also another scalar field sigma or something like that, OK? And it has its fluctuations. What we see today is a zeta, OK? So that's all our observations are consistent with this, this uh, you know, starting with initial conditions where this is some sort of Gaussian random field. So somehow I need to cons to convert this sigma into this zeta. Okay? How do I do it? It's not very difficult. If you look at this equation, you see that this guy is basically more or less the same as the scale factor. Okay? So what I need to do is that regions at some point later in the history of the universe, perhaps during reheating, perhaps at some point, I don't know, whenever you want, 
you, you have to make sigma affect how much the universe expands. So in the values of different, in places with different sigma, you will end up with a different overall expansion and you will generate, a, you will generate this, okay? A different A, in di so now you, this has to be a function of X, right? And so there is the, there's this other field, it freezes out during inflation, it has some fluctuations in the sigma. If you want, uh, if you want to then convert this sigma into um, zeta, you need that somehow in places with different sigma, the universe expands by different amounts, okay? And so the, the total amount of expansion is different in the different regions, so you generate a different A, total A in the different regions. That's not very difficult to do. All you need to do is that the equation of state of the matter in the different places of the universe depends on the value of this scalar field. It's not very difficult to do, okay? There are many ways, okay, to do it. So, um, so that's all you need to do. But you see what you're doing, right? So in the context of this discussion, now, during inflation at least, the whole thing is not, uh, during both inflation and, um, and this conversion time, the universe during this time is not, there is not just in an attractor solution in which everybody sees the same history. Because every place in the universe is now labeled by a different value of sigma, right? And this value of sigma actually needs to do something because it needs to affect how the universe exp how much the universe expands. So if now we go look at this, and now we are generating sigma. So these are the, the, the times at which the various sigma modes are generated. At some point, this, and inflation ends, I'm using this sigma to convert into zeta, okay? It better be that this sigma, even though it's very much outside the horizon, is basically a constant in each... It affects things, because if not, why would the universe expand by a different amount over here than over there? So obviously, this, in this setup, there's no attractor, there's nothing like that. There's different histories of the universe, each of them labeled by the value of sigma that happened to be in this region, okay? So when the mode, when this mode is created, and when this mode is converted, let's say all the conversions happen at, at the same time, when it's being converted, it's not this other l larger mode is not invisible. It's supervisible because it, it's being converted itself into the long wavelength perturbations that we see. So we are no longer in the attractor solution. The long mode does not become invisible because there's no attractor. Every region goes through its own history labeled by sigma. And so if for the long mode there's a sigma value here and in the, for the short mode there's another... They just, whatever is going to have, happen here is just adds the sigma here plus the sigma there, add up. And, and the total amount of expansion is some function of the sigma at each location, x, okay? But everybody's visible because that's the whole point. So whatever is this relation, this sequestering of the long modes not being visible anymore is not happening, okay? And as a result, in all of these examples, the squeeze limit is not zero. It goes to some constant, some, some number, okay? And, uh, and so it's a very good discriminatory thing. And in fact, um, so what's the value of, of this parameter in the squeeze limit? Can you get anything? Well, this uh, relation between uh, the, as I was saying, um, all that you are requiring is that the equation of state depends on sigma. And the reason why this relation is not linear and thus you're going to get uh, um, departures from Gaussianity. Among other things is because the Einstein equations are not linear, okay? So there's not much room. You will get large contributions, very large compared... I mean, in inflation we get zero, but here you will get something almost observable. So if you just... In most examples, either you're already ruled out or you're within a factor of a few of the, of the current constraint, okay? But... Um, so, so this limit is very interesting because of this reason, okay? Because it really goes to the, to the heart of the attractor nat nature of the inflationary solution. It's of the single field uh, um, adiabatic mode solution. The fact that everything was diluting away makes it such that the long mode becomes invisible at the time the short mode is created, and so not you should see nothing, okay? Any questions? Now, uh, good, so what about 
some large non-Gaussianity like the one that would be created if CS is uh, less than 1. It's clearly not something of this form. It doesn't have anything in the squeeze limit. In fact, in the squeeze limit, it goes down in this way. Okay? So that thing is something that peaks the, the, the contribution uh, proportional to 1 over CS. It peaks at the equilateral triangles. Okay? So if we want... So by measuring the three-point function, we can tell those two things apart. We can tell whether or not the CS, by looking at equilateral triangles, whether or not things are propagating faster, um, slower than the speed of light, or we can tell whether there are other fields by looking at this limit. Both of these two things are uh, possible. And uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is this example. What is this telling us? Okay, so... Um, so... Um, this is very much related to whether I start with the adiabatic vacuum or not for doing the calculation, okay, or for uh, the assumption of the state. Why? Imagine that you're doing, uh, so, um, um, imagine that you have the three modes, okay, the K1, K2, K3, there are three modes comparable, more or less comparable, and we are starting well inside the horizon, okay? If the, if the three Ks are like that, in the perfectly collapsed thing. Notice that uh, K1 plus K2, the, the, the frequencies of each of them, let's say that uh, they are also traveling at the speed of light, say, so omega is K times CS. So if the Ks are all in a line like that, the three Ks uh, uh, add up to zero also means that the three omegas add up to zero, right? Not, it, that would not be the case in a triangle that's not collapsed, but this would mean that omega 1 plus omega 2 gives you omega 3 or omega, I don't remember what name is, one, 1 plus 2 equals 3, okay? So this means that when you're doing the time-dependent perturbation theory, you, you are forcing this mode with a, with a source term which has the exact same frequency, okay? So there's a resonance, okay? So you're forcing this guy with somebody with the exact same frequency, it's a harmonic oscillator, force harmonic oscillator, so there be a resonance. And so you will have, yeah, just like... If, uh, if you are doing that, you will, you will have, uh, if this is possible, if, if you have excitations, waves here plus waves there, they would resonantly produce the wave there. And so you will have a big amplitude if these things are not in the vacuum. Okay? So when you look at the, at the calculations of the three-point function, if you assume some departure from, uh, from uh, the vacuum, you will see an enhancement in this limit. Okay? I don't rem I wasn't in the Nima stock, but uh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he he creates particles. He has things. So yeah, he he has that. Um, another example where um, this. So you might think, uh, okay, how are you? Hell, are you going to have modes that are start already excited? Okay, an example are people that consider potentials that have some sort of. Uh, so there's some potential like this. You put in some. Uh, some wiggles on this potential. So when the when the inflaton field is going here, as it goes around, um, it the background has some frequency to it. Okay, and so as modes uh, get start at high frequency and then they are get redshifted by the expansion, they cross this frequency and they get a little bit excited and then they continue their way. So after this frequency, after after the mode passes this frequency, which is uh, a shorter frequency than Hubble, they are all a little bit excited, okay? And so then when they freeze and so on, depending on the ratio of, the, of this exciting frequency to Hubble and so on, you can get this behavior and you get a little bit of an enhancement in the, in the collapsed limit. Um, but so you can see that, uh, that the actual shapes of the non-Gaussianity um, also tell us they, they have nice uh, physical... Uh, physical um, Interpretation, okay? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, you mean um, so? For example, here. Um, 
Yeah, but the but so the difference has to be created if you want by the by a mode of, of this uh, of this uh, size, right? And it's true. So I've focused on the um, on the uh, example in which the long mode that is the short thing it was something produced during inflation but also this same thing applies if i'm considering something some remnant from before something that was some a little bit of inhomogeneity in the universe now but the same argument applies completely that the effect of these other guys is down by this factor now because it's something that was pr so all of these modes we are observing them and we know that they start with um, with a size 10 to the minus 5, the ones that are being produced during inflation. So the effect of this mode on this is 10 to the minus 5 plus some extra suppression. For the modes that uh, start from the very beginning, they can be anything in principle. So they could be 1, I don't know. Zeta can start by 1. But So you only need to... So yes, they will show up, and to some extent we don't see them, and... Uh, and so this means that you have to put, if you started at one, then you need to put some extra more, so more inflation between, so that they dilute even more, so that we don't see any effect, because we haven't seen it. Not on the shape, well, uh, okay, also you can use this bound. So the thing is that this is so fast, this is an exponential, right? So um, a few e folds more, and it's just, uh, but it's true that, for example, if the potential was, uh, very, it became rapidly very shallow, so that epsilon is very small, and so on, on, on longer wavelengths, zeta zeta is much bigger than 10 to the minus 5, then that much bigger needs to be suppressed by this in order for us not to see. Yeah, there is a bound like that. Or even if you go to the beginning and you say, okay, zeta can be anything, but the, it's all true, but unfortunately, this is very easy to, I mean, you put two more foldings and then you do a lot. So, any other question? Okay, so um, let me let me before yeah. So let me say um, let me comment on. Uh, okay, so a um, few more comments. So um, so let's let's discuss the formula. Uh, let's discuss what 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 is the formula in the in the case where there is no other field and. Uh, just the standard, no CS, nothing. The standard, uh, the standard single field uh, slow roll inflation. Okay, so this was first the, the first computed by Juan. That 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 uh, formula. And I already told you in the squeeze limit it should go to zero, but I want to be slightly more careful about that. And I also told you that there will be an equilateral. Uh, there will be a contribution like this, which is of size epsilon. Okay. So I want to comment on those two things a little bit. So I told you um, that in the squeeze limit, the effect should be zero of the long mode. This is true. But uh, what is not true is that the three-point function is actually zero. Okay, um, And I, in my opinion, it's zero. But uh, the way we write it, so it's, it's, it's zero. But in the coordinates that we have, uh, I'm just mentioning this because you will see a lot in the literature and stuff like this. So, in the coordinates that we have, the three-point function is not zero, but it goes to some spe very specific value, and this is called the Maldacena consistency condition. So, it's, it, it, it doesn't say zero. So, in the squeeze limit, blah blah blah. So, you will see this discussion. So, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. So, um, why don't why in the in in the what, what is the what do you get when you look at the three point function of standard inflation in the in the squeeze limit so what you get is not exactly zero and it's the following very simple thing um so what i told you is because of the presence of the long mode okay um you're in this space time okay now you notice that this space time is not I said it's the same, and it's true, it's the same, because it's just um, um, a rescaling of x, right? So if I 
in physical coordinates where this, the whole thing, whatever it is, is the d square x physical, okay, then it's the same, okay? But we don't present the calculation in, the, in some physical coordinate. We present it in the original coordinates x that we have from the very beginning, okay? So, in these coordinates, in the different regions of the universe where zeta takes a different value, what x means is slightly different, right? It's different if you want in the universe today, the same x will correspond to different numbers of megaparsecs, okay? Because there's this, you know, this is the actual distance between two things, but if we represent it as a function of x, and zeta is changing, for a fixed x separation, the actual physical separation is changing as the value of zeta changes, okay? So what is actually true is that uh, if we call in Fourier space, say, k over a e to the zeta zero, if we call this k physical, the power, the amplitude of the power at a fixed k physical is the same in every point in space, okay? Because the long mode is not doing anything, okay? It's just that it's, the long mode is relabeling our co my coordinates, okay? But so if I express everything in physical coordinates, in megaparsecs or something, I mean, that um, then, so this means that, um, so now, um, so why, why will I not see zero in the formula of the three-point function? I will not see zero because when I have the long wavelength mode, here, the, let's say zeta zero has one value, here zeta zero positive, here zeta zero is negative, okay? So here, a fixed x corresponds to a different physical distance. So the power at a fixed physical distance here of modes of the same physical distance is exactly the same. But the, mo the comparison of the power between here and here at a fixed x, not a fixed physical distance, but a fixed x, will be slightly different because now I'm comparing one size with some other size. And to the extent that the power spectrum of fluctuations is not perfectly scale invariant because things were changing a little bit during inflation, then if I compare at a fixed x, I will see in my three-point function a little bit of a change because of the fact that when I compare a fixed x, I'm actually comparing different sizes here, one size here and one size there, one physical size here. But if I relabel everything in terms of this variable, it goes to zero, okay? So in other words, what, what is, is there in the three-point function in the squeeze limit in this consistency condition is basically the dip is proportional to an s minus one. So the three-point function in this limit is proportional to the departures from scale invariant is exactly the, sa the, exactly the needed um, factor so that if you compare the fixed physical, is, there's nothing, okay? But if you compare the fixed x, then you, have, you see something because if things are not scale invariant, okay? So the, the, the physical content of the consistency condition is that in the squeeze limit, the long mode does not have to affect the short mode. That's the physical. Okay, but the way we do the calculation, we see some non-zero value, okay? In any case, it's a very small non-zero value for the point of view of current observations, but still. Um, okay, so that's point number one. Then the point number two that I wanted to make is about this epsilon here, okay? Uh, the way I, I have talked about it uh, so far, um, okay, I put the Lagrange, and that's whatever I get, I get, so it's epsilon, okay? But let me just say that um, um, this is perhaps a little bit surprising. Um, and, uh, and I want to just point to you what this is related to, okay? What, what, why, why you get an epsilon. So let's go back to this formula, okay? And let's think of this um, um, in the, in the, in the j just for an analogy, let's, let's think of the late universe, okay? So today, okay? And let's say that there is some region in which the value, the, the shape of zeta is something, okay? Some parabola, okay? The zeta is a function of x, okay? What is the, what, what is this? What does, what does this really mean? It, this just means that this, the, that, uh, there's some, sur there's some curvature of the surfaces of constant density, okay? So the universe is curved. By how much the omega curvature of this universe is nothing other than the Laplacian of the zeta, okay? The Laplacian of zeta is nothing other than the curve. So I'm assuming this is a very big thing and our horizon is like that, okay? So 
let's say a, 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 a parabola, so a very long wavelength mode, much larger than our horizon, uh, and this is our horizon, what is the effect of this? This is nothing other, if there is such a thing, is nothing other than our universe has a curvature, and the value of the curvature is just Laplacian, or, well, this would be over h squared. So the radius of curvature is related to Laplacian of phi, the inverse radius of curvature. Okay? So um, in the late universe, if you, if, you have, if you live in a curved universe, so I'm, I'm making this analogy in the following. So I'm asking, imagine I have a very long wavelength mode today, or bigger than the horizon. How does this long wavelength mode affect the dynamics of what's happening in our universe today? Okay. Well, if there is a very long wavelength mode, it's just like the curved universe, or at least the Laplacian of it. The, 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 the constant part I can rescale away. Also, the gradient piece of zeta, it can be removed by some coordinate transformation. The first thing that is non-zero is the second derivative of the metric, which is the curvature. Okay, so it's a curved universe with the Laplacian of zeta. Okay, is the curvature. So if we had a long wavelength mode today, um, so I'm comparing uh, in this diagram that I already erased, I guess I erased, yeah. In the diagram of, uh, so today, this was our horizon. Now I'm looking at a longer wavelength, OK? What is it from our point of view? It's just a curved universe, OK? What happens to the perturbations in our universe if it's a little bit curved? OK, I don't know what exactly you did in the large scale structure, but um, the growth of structure and so on is all a little bit changed, OK? By, by what amount? So the rate of growth of structure is uh, changed by a factor of order. So it would be d, the, the growth rate would be the same. Growth will be the same as omega in the omega equals 0 universe, in the uh, flat universe, plus this omega k minus 1 times some other thing, which is so the, an order 1 correction proportional to how different this is from 0. OK? I guess in this way, it's just. Um, 1 minus omega k is this. So it's a curved universe. Okay? So today, if we have a curved universe, it changes everything by a factor of order 1, okay? Com times whatever the perturbation is of the curvature. If there is a 10%, the curve omega k is 10%, the growth of structure will be changed by 10%, give or take some 3 fifths, stuff like this. Okay? So today, a long wavelength mode just enters like that. Okay? Now, um, if you recall what I was telling you before, um, now to be a little bit more precise, in, now let's ask the question, this is the long wavelength mode today. Now let's look at the analogous question. What we're talking about here is the long mode exits the horizon, how it's affecting the short modes that will be generated. It looks the same question, right? For this guy, this is also a curved, you, you would think it's a curved universe, okay? With what curvature is exactly the same? Omega k is Laplacian of, of zeta, okay? Um, and uh, this uh, fact about the squeeze limit and so on means that this is m more like epsilon k square over, or k3 square ah square, okay? So it's the Laplacian of zeta again, so this makes sense. It's the same as we would say today. In reality, the curvature of this is what's affecting things. But while today this is a factor of order 1, in inflation, somehow I get this additional epsilon. Why? OK, what's going on? And this goes back to the same discussion that we had, that the action of the zeta mode was down by this epsilon. In the case, um, and it all boils down to the fact that we are, we are looking at is the fluctuations of this clock. If, the ener if you were in perfect de Sitter, these fluctuations of this clock will be nothing. It's just a relabeling. So it's true, the surfaces of constant clock are curved. But this doesn't do anything if the density is not changing. From There's no gravitational effect from my clock, I curved it. That's your problem. It's not unless really things are changing. But things are changing down by epsilon. Okay? If there's no epsilon, no change. Okay? So, in reality, uh, that's what, so again, the fact that this is so small, even smaller than 1 by this factor of epsilon, so naively you would say, oh, 
um, just from the, the curvature, blah, 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 if the long mole is very large, it can only have the second derivative of the metric is the first thing that can appear, so it would be the Laplacian of zeta, so it would be this. Okay, all fine, but here is where it's encoded, the fact that we are talking about the fluctuations of the clock and not fluctuations in the density. During, during uh, inflation, delta rho over rho was not 10 to the minus 5 in the sense. So the, the surfaces were curved by 10 to the minus 5, but there was no change in the density, or that change in the density was down by some fact, additional factor of epsilon. Okay? So inside of all of these um, formulas, there's all of these um, nice things. I mean, all the properties of inflation, the attractor nature of the solution, if you have a single field, and the fact then the squeeze limit needs to go down. The fact that you, if, you, if you have a propagation different than this field, you have to have interactions, and as a result, those interactions are giving you non gaussian So is everything very nicely encoded in quite model-independent way, because I didn't talk about any, pretty much any model. It's all encoded in these limits of the three-point function, and if you start looking at higher moments, you find these uh, things, uh, additional nice things like that. And fortunately, the perturbations are very small, and so it is very hard to measure, right? So this, um, it's, you know, as we were discussing at the beginning, we have to be lucky or unlucky. Zeta is small, 10 to minus 5. You know, perhaps there's some anthropic reason why it has to be 10 to minus 5 and not 10 to minus 4 or whatever, I don't care. But if it had was 10 to minus 4, it would be much easier, right? Or if, if uh, somehow we were much later in the history of the universe and so the sphere of the CMB was much bigger and we had many more pixels to observe and the lambda didn't kick in and so on. So, okay, tough luck. But uh, um, I think... Um, be, because uh, all of these things, all of these nice properties of uh, ab about uh, the whole picture are really encoded in this uh, three-point function and so on, it's uh, very important that we continue to, to try to make some progress and try to get to better uh, constraints, okay? And in particular, the one that is, uh, that we are very close to, um, achieving a, a much more meaningful constraint is the squeeze limit, okay? And um, um, this, so, um, the, 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 the value that we have constraints now from Planck um, is basically, as I was saying before, already, if you write just some generic uh, other, other field and so on, many times it's ruled out. If not, it's usually off by some factor of a few, okay? So it's really, um, it's really good that we, um, that we try to improve that, okay? Um, and I think that is very, I think we will be able to do it, okay, with the upcoming, uh, um, upcoming observations. So at, at what time do I have to finish now, right? So pretty much? About now, okay, great. So, um, so, okay, let me, so there were a few things that uh, I wanted to say, but I'll just uh, either say them tomorrow or uh, not, don't say them. Okay, sounds good. So this collapse limit is like the collinear limit yeah. in glider. So do, do we also have some consistency issues for the collapse limit? Um, Oh, yes. I don't know of a cons cons